You're listening to Inside Melbourne, the official podcast of the Melbourne Football Club. Proudly presented by Zurich Insurance, ensuring the things you truly love, like this podcast. Hey Dees fans, welcome to Inside Melbourne. My name is Ben Gibson. It is nice to be off Zoom and back at Casey Fields where we can deliver you some crisp audio. We've got uh, two special guests for this podcast. We're going to have GM of footy, Josh Marnie, a little later on. But firstly, a very important man at the moment, Daniel McPherson, the compliance manager. How are you, Frosty? Oh, I'm well, thanks, Benny. Thanks for having me. So your role, you are basically inspecting everyone around the club at all times. Can you mm. talk us through what you've signed up for? Yeah, well, it's um, obviously given the current circumstances, um, the AFL have put in place a compliance officer at each club. Um, nominated by the club to sort of oversee and just make sure everyone's abiding by the rules and regulations that are in place, which are pretty uh, uh, pretty extensive, a um, lot of restrictions on players and staff. Um, so we just sort of need someone to keep an eye on it. Pestering a few people. Have you lost some friends in the past few days? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. There's a few um, relationships that are <laughs> on the edge. But, um, yeah, no, it's all about, you know, obviously... Uh, terrific to get training back up and running um, with a view to the game starting again in three or four weeks so um, yeah it's inconvenient and it's you know it's, it's not natural for you know a lot of the things that we're putting in place we're telling the players to avoid sort of contact with each other and um, you know after being apart for eight weeks all they really want to do is be around each other and muck around like they typically do but um, yeah, you know, it's it's something that we all love, the footy, so if we want to get it back on track, we have to abide by these things. And the AFL sent through a, a pretty big document outlining a few restrictions, so everyone's yep. had to make a few sacrifices at the moment, haven't they? Yeah, it's, um, yeah we got a 40-page document the other night, uh, so there was a bit of reading over the weekend to, to try and get up to speed with all the rules. Um, and then it's sort of just... Um, you know, working out the, the really key things to communicate to the players and stuff so they're really clear on what they are allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Um, and then more specifically for us, how we set up the facility at Casey um, to make it work within those rules. What's your last week looked like planning and prepping for, for being here at Casey and setting everything up for the players to yeah. get the ground running? Yeah, it's been, um, it's been pretty hectic. We, we had an idea that um, training was going to start again this week, but until really late last week um the dates hadn't been defined so um probably wasn't until friday that we that we certainly knew that we'd be back starting again on monday um and then even then it wasn't until friday night until the document came through out- outlining exactly what we could and couldn't do so um it was sort of in a holding pattern a bit uh, until really late in the week so it sort of all weekend was where we had um a lot more clarity around you know the rules and what we could set up um so yeah the last sort of three or four days have been pretty hectic but um yeah we're back and we're training and and everyone seems in pretty good spirit so so we're happy with that just to give the fans a bit of an insight into what's happening at the moment we've got half the list comes in in the morning half in the afternoon yep. uh seven six groups of seven yep. can you talk us through the sort of setup for the players yeah, so um, we're really fortunate at, at Casey because of the uh, facility and the way it's set up. Um, we've been able to segregate those groups really well um, physically. So um, there's there's no crossover between those groups, um, which again is part of the, the rules and regulations. But um, the idea around that is you you minimise the size of the group. So if one person was happened to, to get sick with... Um, the coronavirus is only that number of people in that group uh, have to be quarantined. So um, obviously we hope that doesn't happen to anyone, but um, it just mitigates the risk a little bit by doing it that way. Um, so yeah, fortunately we've been able to secure uh, separate change rooms for each of the groups. Um, and then it's yeah, it's all about the schedule. So as you said, we've effectively split the group in half. Um, three of the small groups come in, in the morning. Uh, they take off about lunchtime and then the the other three come in the afternoon and, and basically repeat uh, the same session. But um, again, everything's done in small groups. And how does that training look? Are the, are the boys in defensive groups? Are they are they mixed up in their yeah, lines? Yeah, essentially they're in line groups. Um, so, you know, there's, there's two forward groups, two backs, two mids. Um, and then one of each of those is morning and afternoon. Um, yeah, this week in particular, it's, it's very basic training. Um, you know, the, the quantity of it's still quite high, but uh, there's no contact or no, no pressure drills allowed. So um, it's very much skill-based and um, 
they did quite a bit of running yesterday. So they're still getting the, the miles in the legs, uh, they're touching the footies again, which making everyone happy. Um, but it's not until next week before they're able to do some contact. And how many people are allowed out on the field at one time? I tried to get out there with the camera and you gave me the big argue. I kicked big you off, argue, yes. But uh, um, how many people actually yeah, can be again, out there? Again, that's all part of the um, rules and regulations, so um, spacing. So you can have two of the groups out on the field at any one time, but um, there's a 20-metre exclusion zone in the middle of the ground that uh, they have to be separated by. Uh, and then on top of that, there's only a four additional people allowed on the ground. So uh, typically that's the head coach who can oversee the groups, but even he has to stay at least five metres from the closest person that he watches. Um, and then uh, medical go- medical staff are allowed out there. So you, know, you might have a doctor and a physio and then a, typically a high performance manager as well. So uh, pretty quickly the 20 get filled up. So um, when people like your good self wander out in the ground, that's why you get the flick. <laughs> now, another big factor at the moment has been the cuts to the footy department, down yep. to 24 staff. <clears throat> Have people, I guess, had to do a lot of things outside their traditional role? Yeah, there's, um, yeah it's sort of um, all hands on deck uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, the way we've um, set it up is we don't have um, trainers here. So, um, you know, it, it makes it a bit busier um, in terms of just organising, you know, getting the footies and the drinks and the bibs and the jumpers and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, as much as we can, people that are, you know, here but not actually doing something at any one time, they they tend to pitch in and help. So, um, yeah, it gets it done, but, um, yeah, people are, like you said, people are doing stuff they don't normally do, which is fine. And another thing that some people haven't enjoyed so much is the actual test, the COVID test. Yep. Uh, how often do the players have to do this and the staff? And um, Yeah, so we all, um, oh, some of us had had one previously, but everyone had a crack at it last Friday uh, with mi- mixed results. Um, some people thought it was okay. Many people hated it. Um, uh, we'll all get another go this Friday. And then from next week, the players will do it twice a week and the staff once a week for the remainder of the season. So... Um, like it or lump it, we're going to have to get used to it. And I guess it's important, I guess, to share that message to people that if you are uh, feeling unwell, it's not the end of the world. It is a, a little bit of a tickle up the. Yeah, it's not pleasant. Um, it's yeah, it's quite awkward, really. Um, I actually had it done a month or so ago, uh, and I didn't think it was too bad the first time, but. The one the other day, I uh, didn't really enjoy that at all. So hopefully uh, the one this week's um, a bit kinder to me. That's good to know because I had my first last Friday and didn't think it was too bad, but <laughs> I'll get back to you this Friday. Thanks for your time, Frosty. We're going to have Marns up after the break with questions from the outer. No worries. Thanks, Benny. Thanks to our co-principal partner and podcast sponsor, Zurich Insurance. For over 100 years, they've been insuring the people and things you truly love. And just like you, they truly love footy and they truly love the Ds. You're listening to Inside Melbourne and we've had a quick change of guests. Josh Marnie has jumped in the hot seat. It's been a dream of yours to come on the podcast. Uh, are you excited to be here? Yeah, thanks, Gibbo. Um, I've, I've watched a number of people come onto this podcast before and I've been waiting for the call. So I know it's taken a worldwide pandemic for me to finally get onto this um, podcast, but I appreciate it. It is a great honour. Now, I'm going to jump straight into questions from the outer because the questions coming through on social media were phenomenal, the best yet. So I okay. don't know if that's reflective of the guest, but... First up from Roy, what happens if a player or coach tests positive whilst the season has restarted? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it's one of the reasons that why we're in small groups at the moment is to um, limit the exposure. Um, you know, Basically, if someone gets tested positive, if we have to follow the same guidelines as everyone does in the public health system. So really about uh, minimising the amount of people having contact with that person is a really important thing at the moment. As it stands right now, if someone was um, tested positive in one of those small groups, uh, that whole group would be isolated for a period of time. Um, So all the protocols that have been put in place around our facility at the moment, the reasons why we're being so stringent with doing that is trying to minimise that exposure to that that group of players. We heard from Frosty a little earlier in the show that they were training in defensive forward mid groups. Is there any risk that comes with that by putting them all together? I think there's this way different ways of looking at that and how to um, put your groups together. I mean, first of all, you've got to back in all the protocols that have been put in place by the AFL and the, the changes we've made to our lifestyles, the changes we've made to facility and the programs, and then talk about the program and say, well, we want to maximise our performance while they're actually here 
and we think it's a real advantage having our, our players train together. Um, we spoke about that last year. That it's a lot of what we missed through pre-season last year was just building that understanding and cohesion between our groups, and it's been a focus of ours over pre-season. We thought that was really important to continue doing that. Now, there's been staff cuts. We've had a change of location, AFL restrictions. Jack's asking what the biggest challenge has been for the group. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, there's been a lot of different challenges along the way, and... Um, I'd probably break it down to different phases that we went through is probably that that initial, and I remember the first time we ever spoke about COVID-19, our doctor, uh, Dr. Zishan Arrain, just called a casual meeting between us, myself, our CFO, and um, our HR, uh, head of HR, and it was about, you know, this thing is happening overseas, um, it's a virus, maybe we should start looking at doing some things, and that was on a Tuesday, and I think within 10 days, we'd done all the things you spoke about, we'd moved the facility, all of a sudden made all these changes. And I think that was, um, it really set the scene for us that we always felt we were sort of half a step ahead of um, of what we needed to do in terms of protocols. And so, you know, that was initially, it was a bit of a shock to everyone. It was such a change of what we usually do. And so that was probably the initial phase was actually getting those things set up. Um, then the second phase when the AFL, you know, the season was shut down, that was a, that was a pretty scary stage for everyone. and. I remember flying back from Perth um, after we'd just played against West Coast and it was pretty late at night and it all just hit me straight away. I was like, all of a sudden, to be involved in this industry for so long, you never, ever thought it would be shut down for any reason at all. And straight away, you're looking around the, um, the playing, trying to think of how this is going to impact your staff and your players. So that was probably the next phase. It was more worried about um, how they're all going to get through this period of time. And then it was obviously people were living from home, making sure they're comfortable and staying engaged. And then we moved into, probably it was more of an exciting stage, was about how do we get back to returning to play. And then we were hit with probably another hard one, which was about choosing a headcount of our staff to come back. And, um, and we spoke to a lot of our staff and players over the, the shutdown period. We spoke about what do you miss about not being part of footy? And people spoke about things about the competitiveness, the high intensity, um, but the most consistent thing was the people. And that's probably been the hardest part now is to make decisions on, we actually are telling people they can't come back into the facility and be involved in the program and be involved with the people, which is what we really miss. So that was probably been the hardest part in uh, the conversation we had to have in the last um, two weeks, because not just our club, <clears throat> but every club's gone through it. And we've um, you know, got a lot of really good people that aren't in the industry right now. On the back of those staff cuts, Fiona wants to know if we're going to use this time to look at restructuring the coaching staff, the admin, and or if you think you'll potentially bring everyone back in the next few years. I think the way we've looked at um, our staffing is to say, you know, what are the key elements that we have to keep in our football department? You know, every different area of the department plays a role in, de in developing and you know, maximising the performance of the overall program. So the way we looked about it is what are the key elements that we need to maintain in every different area? And then just really, you know, what are, what are the areas that we can maybe go without for a little bit? Um, so slight um, restructures, um, slight changes in roles. Um, you know, I think we're going to find that people have to be a bit more adaptable to play a number of different roles uh, within the program moving forward. But really our focus was on building the best program for season 2020 and maximising this season going ahead. And we know we have to make some, some um, decisions on 2021, but there'll be a time to make those when there's more information out probably in the next four or six weeks. There's been a lot of talk over the last few years that we're looking to get a new facility. Uh, Luke wants to know if this has affected that at all. No, from my understanding, it hasn't. Um, I mean, Purdy's been you know, very heavily in those conversations with the government and, and MOPT and, and the AFL. And you know, from all those stakeholders, they're still you know, willing to to look at a facility in the area that we've identified. Um, so I think at the moment it's probably on a pause for a period of time because um, there's a lot of things to be working through, but you know, still uh, I'd imagine there'd be something to be happening there. The Casey facility is looking good. Uh, this one comes in from Nathan Jones asking if your baby, <laughs> referring to the facility, is ready, really going to be ready to go come the first week of July. We've got a bit of works over there. Um, how's that tracking? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great option to have to be able to come down here and... Um, you know, speaking to someone today about you know, how we've been able to spread the players over three change rooms to be able to lock down the facility and be able to follow all the protocols the AFL put in place and to be coming out on a, on a, on a great ground. Um, it's got a lot of advantages and 
yeah, the building that's going on at the moment, which Jonesy's called my baby. Um, it's a it's a new it's a brand new gym and a new indoor training facility, which you know it's been funded by the Andrews government and the city of Casey and the AFL and. Yeah, you know, that was um, you know, given for women's football and for AFLW, um, but it's obviously going to be used by you know AFL program and, and VFL VFLW program. So, you know, the July, the first week of July, I think I'm going to win a lot of money if it is, because everyone doesn't think it's going to be ready. Um, I just went back and checked on the timelines. It does look like it's going to be on that timeline, so I'm going to back in the builders at this stage. There you go. We'll keep an eye on that. We're getting quite deep here, given that we missed both major money-making games in Queen's Birthday and Anzac Eve being a home game this year will we push to have them in 2021 that is coming from shane yeah i think we definitely push for it and i think it's um we're well within our rights to to ask for that and yeah i know there's going to be a lot of conversations about that but it'd be definitely an ask of, of the club to you know be hosting those two really important games for us back on field a little update on harley bennell how's he looking yeah he seems everyone wants to talk about harley <laughs> um well i just watched him train again today and it's his now it's his second session for the week and that's probably the most positive thing that he's, he's joining in the, the training we're doing at the moment, which is a step in the right direction. Um, we'd always had the idea that he'd be ready at mid-season. Um, just happens to be mid-year, but it's round two. Um, so nothing's changed from that point of view. And you know, he's tracking really well. And that's probably one of the benefits out of you know, this lockdown period is that there's been some players that have been able to utilise it to, to really progress through their rehab um, really well. And you know, guys like Mitch Hannon, um, you know, Aaron Vanderberg is getting closer now. Joel Smith, who wasn't ready round two. Christian Salem. Nathan Jones didn't play round two. So, you know, um, we'll have a pretty healthy list to choose from for round two. Probably only three or four at the moment who wouldn't be available. There's going to be no VFL this season. How's it going to be trying to select blokes? How are they going to push for their selection without playing at Casey? Yeah, so it's, it, there may still be a VFL. It's just at the moment no AFL players will be playing. So it's, um, it is going to be different. Um, and you know, we've spoken to the players about the importance of training. Uh, we know that training can be motivating for a little period of time, but we all play this game to play. We want to play. So I know the AFL are looking at some options within that, whether it's um, some scratch matches against other clubs. Um, I think that we'll be encouraging that really strongly to make sure they've got something to look forward to for the weekend. Um, if, if that doesn't happen, then it'll, it again, we'll be doing a lot of match simulation training and you know, the heat will be on the coaches to pick a team from that. Now, every week we get the same questions about bombing the ball inside 50. We're, we're going to talk about it one last time and then I don't think I'll bring it up for the rest of the year on this podcast. But what can we do about it? Uh, we've only played one game, so it's a small sample size. But is it something that's being addressed? Yeah, it is something that's being addressed and we've just got to keep training. Um, and Our connection between our midfield and our forwards, it's been... It's something we've been continually working on and we've shown some really good signs in the pre-season games. The West Coast game, uh, we didn't play well um, and West Coast are very good at intercept marking so it probably showed out we didn't do that well and we, we, we bombed when we, we didn't really want to. It's something we're working on and you know, it's still been a focus for us to make sure we get that connection. I mean, it's the whole term of bombing it inside 50 is there's times when you do kick the ball long inside 50. I mean, it's still a bit of a territory game but the teams that have the ball inside 50 the most generally win the game. Um, in an ideal world, you get it in there and you score straight away. But there's sometimes it's just about having the ball in that area as well is such an advantage too. There's been a few people sort of talking about how winning a premiership this year would not mean as much as any other year and that it's not a great year to end a drought. I'm guessing internally everyone's still pretty keen just to win every game that they can. Yeah, I think um, rather than <coughs> having a, a bad asterisk next to it, have a highlighter yeah. saying um, this is an unbelievable premiership to win. You know, no one's been through this before. I mean, the way that everyone's had to adapt, not only up until this point, but we've been told to stay agile through the season as well. At the moment, we may receive the first four to six weeks in a week's time uh, of the fixture, and then we just got to be ready for whatever gets thrown at us. So that's our focus, and what Goody's pushing really hard for the players is we've got to stay healthy, and we've got to stay agile and ready for anything, and we'll just cop whatever we get, <clears throat> we get thrown. And um, yeah, but in terms of if it breaking a drought, I don't think anyone's going to worry about what the season looks like. Absolutely, a win to win. How will the shortened, shortened season and lack of other grades of footy impact the club at this year's draft from Wayne? Oh, the draft. Um, probably firstly on that, um, probably a trend in clubs is we don't just look at the one year that's ahead of us. We look at the years in the future as well. Um, probably since f trading future selections came in. So our recruiting team have got a good handle on what this year's draft looks like and yeah, that was part of the reason we traded our first round pick 
last year um, was because of the amount of academy players what we thought would be in the top 30. So we're starting off not from scratch, so we've got a fair idea of what players. Um, we're also comfortable that there will be, you know, leagues will come back at some point and, you know, potentially there will be a national championships and, and, and an under-18 competition at some point through the season. So we still think we'll have an opportunity to look at those players um, and our recruiting team will be no doubt across all that. Now, Alex wants to talk a little bit about the women's team. Obviously, there were some bad knee injuries last season. She wants to know if that's being addressed at all or research into why that is happening. Yes, um, we've been researching it for the four years we've had the program. Um, and up until this year, we've been you know, really strong in that area. Um, you know, even last year, we had one injury for the whole season. And um, so, yeah, we've already reviewed our season and looked at the five ACLs. You know, you know there's obviously some things that... You know, women and girls are, are more prone to ACLs. Um, out of the five, we had three was a reoccurrence, which again adds the probability of them unfortunately doing the ACL again. But then there's a lot of things that are inconsistent about each event. So it's just continually looking at it. Uh, we're putting a lot of prevention work into trying to strengthen up the muscles around the knees. Um, so we're confident we've got the right people looking at it. We've got Brooke Patterson, who's doing a PhD on, on ACLs. Uh, we've got all our medical staff looking at it and our rehab staff. So... You know, sometimes it can just be unlucky in this area, um, but we also can, can learn from any, any ACL that happens because we want to get our best players out there playing. One last one to finish off, a bit of me time for you. Suzanne's asking, you've played a number of major roles in footy. You've been a player, a coach, administrator. What's been most satisfying for you? <laughs> um, Suzanne, my mum's name's Sue. It's not her, is it? <laughs> I think they've just all got different ways that you get satisfied. I mean, nothing replaces playing. Um, you know, that is just the ultimate, to be able to play and to contribute and to see the impact that you can have by winning games of football and actually having an impact on game day. Um, yeah, that was the most satisfying part out of playing. And you know, to be involved in the premiership with Port Adelaide, to then go around to all the different towns in Adelaide and take the premiership out there, again, you see the ripple effect of how many people are, are impacted by premierships. Um, coaching is then your mind straight away turns to how can you help a player then maximise his potential and you know, there's players that I was able to, to work within. I had a different sort of forward line when I was coaching. Um, you know, Liam Jarrah down there, Austin Wanamiri and Neville Jetta was a forward back then. Uh, Jamie Bennell, uh, Matthew Bate, Brad Millis was a different sort of forward line. But I think then you, you get a lot of your, your joy out of just seeing guys improve and putting things into practice or into place what you practised at training. And um, yeah, really my driver now in the role I'm in now is just to set up a program where the players can maximise this opportunity they've got to be an AFL player and to make sure they've got all the resources around them. So probably don't get to celebrate it as much as you do as a player, a win. Um, you probably straight away, when the, the win happens, you, you change straight away into, OK, what do we do? have to do f tomorrow? Um, but that's probably the most satisfying thing is just to see the, the smiles on not only the players' faces, but all the staff's players, uh, faces just after a game. And the more of those you win, the closer you get to uh, the final series and then ultimately a premiership. That's what we're all here for. Thanks for your time, Mark. That's Martin. right. Thanks, Benny. It's been Inside Melbourne, proudly brought to you by Zurich.